So the first thing I'd really like to focus on is climate change is an issue and the way that people conceptualize it. So a lot of times people think of climate change, it's an issue that we're all facing equally. Um, and they assume that because it's not really impacting their lives very much, it's kind of the same for everybody, it's a tomorrow problem. But that's not actually true. It, it disproportionately affects different groups of people. So I'd love to delve a little bit into that idea. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, that's a great handle on uh, the nature of climate change. Um, even though the, the phenomenon is global, so even its causes are disproportionate, you know, there's the age old debate and argument about how do or which countries are polluting the most and how much money should they contribute to the global effort based on their levels of you know, uh, pollution. And then when you think about impacts, even the impacts are felt differently. And what's even more complicated is that even within the same locality, so you can think about impacts differently between different countries mm -hmm. you know, and different geographies, but even within the same geography, even if we take a uh, locality of Pensacola, mm -hmm. if there is a hurricane, a hurricane hits us right now, um, even when Hurricane Sally hit, when we think about the impacts to that event, we can think about them along three, I guess, strands. Mm -hmm. you know? So when we think about how vulnerable are you to the impact of a hurricane, we think about exposure. You know? So where exactly do you live? You know, do you live in a place that is likely to get flooded you right. know, with uh, increased precipitation or um, do you live in a place that has a lot of trees you know and so the tree gonna fall on your house that happened to my neighbor's house to Hurricane Sally yeah. you know right next you know right across you know a tree fell onto the roof yeah. right beside us a tree fell onto the neighbor behind them oh you know roof you know so again that makes you more exposed mm -hmm. you know to just physical damage and you think about sensitivity so in that even if exposure was the same or minus exposure mm -hmm how will people individually respond? So when you take, even for the, again, for the example of the, the hurricane, um, maybe somebody has arthritis, you know, and so when the weather changes, you know, they have, you know, pain in their joints or something like that. Mm. So we can all be experiencing, oh, it's cold, it's windy, but someone with arthritis is going through a really much harder time. You know, someone may have seasonal affective disorder. So yes, even though it's cloudy and dark and the lights are out, um, somebody with seasonal affective disorder is more impacted by just the lights being out there and be a hurricane. Somebody may be on oxygen, you know, and so when the lights are out, yes, we all experience a power outage, our food is going bad, mm -hmm. but someone's life depends on access to constant power, right. you know, because they use oxygen tanks. And then the last thing we can think about is adaptive capacity. So the event has happened, it's gone. How are we re recovering? You know, even when you look around a community, um, some people's blue top went away in a month, mm -hmm. uh, in two months. Some people, it took a whole year. Some houses still have blue top, you know, mm -hmm. on their roof. Yes. And so just the ability to um, recover, recover right. you know, I'll be thinking about insurance, you know, uh, which homes are insured better than mm -hmm. others. You know, people who live on the coast may be more exposed, but they may have a bigger adaptive capacity because mm -hmm. they are they own million dollar homes and so maybe they have Right. in excess of a million dollars and they're used to like they're being flooding and storm said mm -hmm. so we're just going to rebuild their houses may be designed to you know account for um storm surge and things like that and so yeah when you think about exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity even at a hyper localized scale it makes the impacts you know very differential hmm. and so Bec this is something that governments are, are trying to address, yeah. is this sort of inequality. So yeah. an example that comes to mind is something like a Superfund site, gotcha. right? Gotcha. So gotcha. it's like, how are we, uh, I know a lot of what you do is figure out how can we achieve positive outcomes for both stakeholders on yes. property, yes. the people who live there. Yes. Yes. I'd love to just delve in, what is a Superfund site? Yes, yes. yes. So a Superfund site is basically a contaminated land. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, we have what we call a national priority list, um, where we've categorized or categorized lands that are contaminated according to sort of the specific types of contaminants and right. also the level of intensity, you know, just how, how much is in the soil. And so usually there could be a form of paper mill or a paint factory or even they were just processing, you know, some chemical, Something you know, industrial. exactly, mm -hmm. industrial sites. And so usually 
the industries are no longer, you know, in, 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 in operation, mm -hmm. but then they've left a legacy of contaminants in the soil. Mm -hmm. So we typically have brownfields and superfund sites, and superfunds are on oh. the higher end of the scale. So um, the term the super... The most contaminated? Exactly. So brownfields are generally disuse some contamination, but mm -hmm. superfunds are usually on the higher end of, mm -hmm. that, of that contamination scale. And um, when we think about the term superfund actually comes from... Uh, the, the act that sort of made way for the Superfund program is called CERCLA, uh, mm -hmm. Comprehensive Environmental Response and Cleanup Liability Act, right. I think, CERCLA. Um, but it's such a huge act mm -hmm. covering many, many dimensions in, in the federal government. And mm -hmm. so people were like, oh, it's a super fund for cleanup, you know, right. like, but it, it's not like there's a ton of money just sitting there. Yeah. But because it touches all these areas, people refer to it as super fund. So super fund mm -hmm. sites are on the higher end mm -hmm. uh, of that. Um, locally, I've worked on two Superfund sites, mm -hmm. you know, so one uh, uh, was on Palafox Street, or is on Palafox oh, wow. Street. Um, it's been cleaned up, mm -hmm. and so according to the EPA Environmental Protection Agency, it's ready for reuse. Okay. Um, locally, among local government, it's referred to as the Midtown Commerce Park, mm -hmm. because that's a vision for the park, you know, to, mm. to, to sort of develop it into a commerce park. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I know, um, they haven't yet found investors you know for mm. the site it's so uh, it's been something that a conversation that rises mm -hmm. and falls ebbs and flows um because i think ideally the county would like uh what they call an anchor tenant you know somebody to mm -hmm. come in do a lot of the redevelopment and then maybe a rent out you know mm -hmm. plots uh to like smaller retail businesses so they haven't yet found that or even if they have found there may be some issues with the county maybe has other priorities at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, another one is within the city of Pensacola mm -hmm. uh, that is called the American Creative Work Site. Mm -hmm. It's uh, close to Sanders Beach, you know, um, in downtown Pensacola. That one is still being cleaned up. It's mm -hmm. all, cleanup is almost complete. Mm -hmm. um, and for that one, the vision has been more of um, uh, what they call a passive park, you know, so right. to have just a park that they can access. They've engaged more with the residents, you know, mm -hmm. who live around that. But when you think about a public park, is it only the people who live next to the park who get to say what it should be used for? Or is a mm -hmm. public park citywide property? Right. Should all CD stakeholders have a say of what gets put right. on that park? You know, so it, it really gives way to some very interesting debates. <laughs> I'm <on> sure. To, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> what should we use it for, yeah. you know, and, and who gets to determine what mm -hmm. kind of use it has and things like that, you know, so... Uh, yeah, those are the, I think locally, those are the super fun projects I've been involved in. So know. what does the process look like of cleaning up a site like this? How do you yeah. take something, you know, where maybe the soil is deeply contaminated and restore it? Yeah. Um, so it is a complex <laughs> process. You know, the uh, EPA, we should come in and do testing, you know, mm -hmm. on the front end, you know, just determine exactly what kinds of contaminants mm -hmm. are on there, even their levels of, of harm to people if they, right. they may be exposed to that. And then usually once they determine that, you know, and they may contract even that testing out, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they work a lot with contractors. And then, uh, okay, we've determined, you know, contamination. Then we have to determine ownership of mm -hmm. that site, you know. Typically, especially for super funds, um, the liability is so strong, uh, so high right. that um, owners will have to basically uh, give up the site to the federal government uh, so that the federal government can sort of take on that liability right. and then clean up and then sell it back to a local uh, municipality. Uh -huh. um, there was a story of on the Palafox site in Escambia County where by some weird design, a portion, just a few acres of the site mm -hmm. were for an individual owner. Uh -huh. It was like, this is my site. I'm oh. going to put my trailer on it. I'm not going to leave. Yeah. And <laughs> the EPA was like, okay, fine. Here's your liability bill in yes. millions of dollars. And they were like, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, so they had to basically uh, give up ownership because yeah. usually the sites are contaminated that you can't do anything productive with it. You right. know? And so um, individuals, property owners cannot really take on um, responsibility for cleanup. Mm -hmm. And so the federal government then steps in mm -hmm. and says, okay, we will clean it up. We we'll give it back to the municipality, mm -hmm. and then they will decide about about reuse. So then we have to figure out ownership mm -hmm. uh, as well. Then we do clean up, and usually some of because you know when it comes to soil contamination, mm -hmm. uh, some of these contaminants can sit in the ground like for really really long, 
And some of them are even not removable once they're put in. So, so is that something that we would refer to as like forever chemicals? Exactly, in mm -hmm. that sense. And so we would then uh, put a cap on it. So usually mm -hmm. we, we try to clean up there. We sometimes use some aerators or other devices to basically remove as much as we can. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, they just cap it, you know. And so mm -hmm. that's what happened with the Palafox site. Right. And I think that's what also happened with the American Creosote's uh, work site in, mm -hmm. in downtown Pensacola, where at some point they had to put a cap, basically. Mm -hmm. So we have sealed it, uh, mm -hmm. nobody touch it, nobody puncture it. Um, mm -hmm. And then we can then decide to reuse, you know. So once right. it's ready for reuse, then um, uh, usually the municipality would have ownership for it, mm -hmm. then the county or the city. And then there is a discussion on what should we use it for, right. and then who, and that's when then it gets really messy and differential because sometimes people have been forced to move away. You know, mm -hmm. for example, for the um, Escambia site, um, um, there used to be a community, a predominantly African American community that lived around there. They had to be relocated because of the cleanup. It was it was yeah. toxic. You know, they couldn't live there. Yeah. But now that they've moved away, people you know have had to go on to other things. Maybe people even have lost livelihoods because mm -hmm. that move away. Mm -hmm. When it gets cleaned up, are we going to look for those people again right. and say, hey, we're going to give you first dibs on a job? Right, that right, typically right. doesn't happen, you know. And so uh, <laughs> there are all, all these, these, these events or these displacement that mm -hmm. comes with yes. cleanup of these sites. And sometimes we don't always think about those things as and well as we should. Yes. And you've worked on studying how displacement affects people yes. far beyond Pensacola. Yes. Yes. You've studied Mali and Malawi and yeah, Ghana. Yes. I'd love to know more about what you discovered in your work okay, there. Okay, okay, yeah. So a lot of this was my PhD uh, mm -hmm. uh, research student. as a PhD student um, at the University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I worked um, uh, the research group of the Humanitarian uh, Response and Development Lab, which mm -hmm. is now at Clark University. That's yes. where my PhD advisor is right now. Um, and so when it came to the work that we did in Mali, uh, we were really thinking about how can people use weather forecast or climate forecast, mm -hmm. you know, to think about agricultural decision making, mm -hmm. you know. So what, um, if we tell people that there's going to be um, a big precipitation event, you mm -hmm. know, um, if there's a crop they need to plant before the rain hits, can they mm -hmm. go ahead, you know, is, is that information going to be timely enough for them to go ahead and plant? Or if we're going to tell them there's going to be a drought this season, can they shift, you know, quickly enough or pivot mm -hmm. quickly enough to be able to uh, um, to, to plant the crops that will help them. Mm. Because that region, you know, has experienced, you know, a famine in the past and, and, and other things. And so those things are still in people's memory and mm -hmm. consciousness, right. you know. Um, what we call sea defense systems, you know. So basically, it's just coastal protection infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So this was in the River Delta in Ghana. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called the Volta River Delta. Mm -hmm. The Volta River is the largest man-made lake in the world mm -hmm. because, or well, it was dammed to create the largest man-made lake. Uh, because we dammed it at its mouth uh, mm -hmm. to create uh, uh, the Kusumbo Dam, which provides almost maybe 90%, mm -hmm. if maybe maybe slightly less now, of Ghana's electricity. Yeah. And so because the, you know, the delta has, uh, the, the river has been dammed, mm -hmm. sediment you know, flow to the coast has been reduced. You know? mm -hmm. So that is a major reason why we're seeing increasing erosion at the coast. Mm -hmm. But then there is also climate change right. happening. And there also is a slight bit of uh, land subsidence. You know, the land mm -hmm. is sinking just over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And so these complex and compounding factors, you know, give way to a lot of erosion mm -hmm. and a lot of flooding. The question then is, what is the primary cost? You mm -hmm. know, is it the damming right. of the river? Is it sea level rise? Mm -hmm. It's all of these factors. And so mm -hmm. the government was like, well, we want people to be able to stay in place. We want people to remain and do their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to build this coastal protection infrastructure. Mm. Um, and does that look like seawalls? Seawalls, yes, mainly. Yes, yes mainly seawalls. Uh, some structure also called uh, groin. So basically, mm -hmm. there are rocks piled perpendicular to the shoreline mm -hmm. at regular intervals. And so over time, uh, land is supposed to sort of build up in between mm. the rocks, you know. Mm -hmm. So you will, you know, basically dig, <laughs> dig a bit, a bit into the sand, construct the rocks, you know, usually hold them together with some kind of wire mesh or something mm -hmm. of that sort. Uh, you either pump, usually see from the seabed or if there's a lagoon behind from the lagoon, do sort of an initial mm -hmm. fill in, and then over time the land builds up. So a very effective groin system mm -hmm. would 
would, would, be, would cover all the rocks to the extent that you won't be able to really see the rocks mm -hmm. after time. And that means like you reclaim as much of the land as you mm -hmm. could. Um, and would you consider that something like building a living shoreline? Or in in, a, in like a, a sense, those, those shorelines are less living mm -hmm. because usually because they've packed sand and all of those things, it, vegetation can't really grow. I you see. Know, and yeah. even in Ghana, the beaches are such that vegetation does not really grow mm -hmm. close to the, you know, the mm -hmm. water's edge. Um, huh. there, there were some things about considering sea turtle nesting because some of those beaches were sea turtle mm -hmm. nesting sites. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, of course, with, with, with sea turtles, I don't know if you know this, but uh, they hone back to the beaches mm -hmm. where they were born in. Yeah. You know? So if you've changed the sand, those turtles are going to get lost. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they won't be able to find their way back. And even if they do find their way back, just that all of that change, all that construction mm -hmm. is going to mess up you mm -hmm. know, the ability they to They might nest. not feel safe to Exactly, nest, right? exactly. You know? So there were you know, attempts to, to consider how can we make the, the beaches still safe for the turtles. Mm. Um, but in Ghana, they build these structures, and then um, once they build the structures, so now the land is technically protected. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is that then it became prime real estate land. You mm -hmm. know, typically in Ghana, or even conventionally or traditionally, coastlines are not really real est prime real estate. Right. It's a more recent phenomenon oh, in, where I come from. So typically, it's the poor fisher folk who live mm -hmm. by the coast. You know, even in the capital city, in the past, in Accra the sort of urban poor lived on the coastline, mm -hmm. you know. But over time, you know, with globalization, all those things, right. people have realized, oh, this is prime beach property. Let's mm. build a luxury resort. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what happened wow. at the mouth of the estuary. They mm -hmm. protected it. Then a company came in and was like, oh, <laughs> this is prime real estate. We want to mm -hmm. build luxury resorts. There was a fishing community right in, you know, where they wanted to build a resort. And so then there was a fierce battle because right. they were like, well, you have to go. And the people were like, no, <laughs> this is our home. Right. Um, and the so whole there was point was to protect these people's exactly, way of living. And now exactly. that it's good, they're being gentrified. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Essentially. You know? And so we see this a lot with our response to contamination, our response to a changing climate. Yes. You know, as environmental changes are happening and occurring, mm -hmm. um, social changes are also happening mm -hmm. simultaneously where... So the social fabric is changing. Uh, people are being pushed out. Right. Um, income compositions are changing mm -hmm. in response to environmental changes. And so it's important to recognize that as we respond to environmental changes as human beings, mm -hmm. we've got to try to uh, maintain the social fabric. Or even mm -hmm. if it's going to require shifts in the social fabric, we do it in a way that it's not going to disproportionately mm -hmm. impact you know, the most marginal in the society. Right, because we have a site, like you were saying, in downtown Palafox exactly. that was majority you said African American. Yes, yes. And yes. now those people have been displaced. Yes, the land yes. has been cleaned up. Yes. The property value suddenly goes up, and yes. maybe those same people can't afford to live yes, there anymore. Yes, yes, yes. And so, are we really helping people, or are we just investing in our property? Yeah. And it's it's a it's a huge debate because we think about the economy, and mm -hmm. then where this is good for the economy, and it is good for the economy to build up, to clean up a contaminated site and yeah. redevelop. It's good for economy, but you have to ask for whom. Mm -hmm. For who, whose economy are we thinking about? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we tend to think of the economy as this big, nameless force that mm -hmm. sort of has a mind of its own. Well, we can't control it. The economic forces are dictating right. things to us, but it really is political decision. Yeah. We make conscious choices about what to invest in. So if mm -hmm. we're going to invest in local individual livelihoods, then we have to put in those protections. Mm -hmm. If you want to think about what is good for the majority, what is good for the highest paying jobs, the mm -hmm. biggest um, employers, and, and come, uh, 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 yes, then maybe we can think along those lines. Right. But nobody was prepared for something like COVID, you know, mm -hmm. because think about, you know, um, Navy Federal. They built this mm -hmm. huge campus, you know, out, you know, on sort of the edges of the county, mm -hmm. you know, out on the uh, end of Nine Mile. And, you know, at the time, you know, I I'd heard county officials say that, hey, Navy Federal is a huge... Um, multiplier for our mm -hmm. local economy. Mm -hmm. um, they bring in a lot of jobs. You want such companies, kind of companies, to come right. even onto this site. Right. COVID happened. Now, from what I know, a lot of Navy Federal workers don't even go to into that campus, campus anymore. They're all mm -hmm. working remote. You know, so right. imagine the amount of money and all that was mm -hmm. invested into building that campus. It, it's on hindsight, it seems as if it might not have all been worth it. Yes, mm -hmm. it's good that we have. Uh, the jobs and everything, but mm -hmm. these jobs cannot be done from almost anywhere, mm -hmm. you know. And right. so, again, if we think only about the big 
industry players and the big economic uh, multipliers, mm -hmm. you know, what happens when something that we would nobody could have prepared for, like COVID mm -hmm. happens, you know, mm -hmm. and I think we need to realize that as we're going to the future, our world is so dynamic mm -hmm. and complex and ever changing. And so we need to have approaches that are flexible and that mm -hmm. can pivot at any moment because if we lock ourselves into certain paths of dependencies, mm -hmm we won't be able to recover when, you know, something big like COVID happens. And um, right. I'm not, not to be a prophet of doom, but something like that is likely going to happen again. You know? I and, agree with you. And so how, how, how ready yes. are we going to be? Dr. Kwame, thank you so much yeah. for this discussion. No, thank you for the opportunity. It was, it was really great. I enjoyed it.